It's been a divisive week in Washington, what with the dust-up in the House of Representatives over the president's tweets and the failed attempt by House Democrats to file articles of impeachment. So here's an interesting tale for you. House chaplain Father Pat Conroy offered a morning prayer on the House floor Thursday morning that sounded almost like an exorcism. This has been a difficult and contentious week in which darker spirits seem to have been at play in the people's house. In your most holy name, I now cast out all spirits of darkness from this chamber, spirits not from you. The 68-year-old Jesuit told CNN that his prayer was intended to be nonpartisan and that he was praying for our better angels. Amen to that. As I just discussed with Secretary Pompeo, the persecution of Christians and religious minorities is an all too common phenomenon around the world. My next guest has written extensively about religious persecution. He's been a long advocate, long time advocate for the voiceless. He's a life peer member of the parliament in the UK. Joining us now from a Hudson Institute event on Christians and religious pluralism in the Middle East here in Washington, we're joined by Lord David Alton. David, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, Raymond. Now, you were also in Washington this week for the second annual ministerial to advance religious freedom at the State Department. How important is it that a global effort is being made to advance religious freedom? Well, this was the biggest ever gathering of people from around the world to discuss the persecution of people for their religious beliefs. And the perfect curtain raiser for it was a report published in the UK the week before for our foreign secretary. An independent inquiry said that 250 million Christians worldwide are being persecuted for their faith. So this ministerial, which was the brainchild of the wonderful ambassador at large on religious freedom, Sam Brownback, this event has been what he described as an attempt to break down the iron curtain of persecution around the world. Now, you, you mentioned that report, and I'm going to get to it in a moment, that, uh, that your own uh, government did. But the State Department here in the United States estimates that 80% of the world's population lives in an area with religious restrictions. Is there a consensus at the meetings you've been taking part in this week, is there a consensus to what defines religious freedom and how it needs to be defended? Yes, it has its roots, of course, back in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was crafted here in the United States. Article 18 of that declaration mm -hmm. says that everyone, everyone has the right to believe, not to believe, or to change their belief. But in the same year, in 1948, thanks to Raphael Lemkin, a, a Jewish lawyer, 40 of whose family had perished in the Holocaust, crafted the Genocide Convention. Now, it took until the 1960s for the US to sign up to that. But the US, the UK, and many other countries are signatories. And yet we know both the Universal Declaration and the Convention are routinely, regularly, daily honored in their breach. You know, I've traveled in countries like North Korea, Sudan, uh, Syria, countries where people's rights are violated on a daily basis in horrific circumstances. Mm -hmm. This isn't just discrimination, it's not even mild persecution. In Pakistan, where I was last November, I heard, for instance, the case of two children, Christian children, forced to watch their parents burnt alive by a mob of 1,200 people. I've taken witness statements from people who've escaped from the gulags in North Korea. I met recently with Uyghurs, Muslim Uyghurs, who had escaped from Western China, where they've been suffering terrible depredations. And that's been quite a theme here at the conference this week, the plight of Christians in China. It's something that the world is beginning to wake up to. Mm. So holding people to account for the things that they have done, especially genocide. If this is the crime above all crimes, Raymond, then people must be brought to justice. And there are no mechanisms at the moment in the world mm. to do that. And I think that one of Sam Brownback's ambitions now is to find a mechanism for holding people to account and ending the impunity which currently reigns. Mm. Your British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, commissioned a report of the independent inquiry in persecution yeah. of Christians in December. Now, the findings came out last week and they concluded that the persecution of 250 million Christians around the world compromises, quote, the most shocking abuses, or comprises rather, the most shocking abuses of human rights in the modern era. Were you surprised by the number of persecuted Christians cited we in the report? 
Well, I wasn't. I gave evidence to the inquiry, but I was so pleased to see how seriously our Secretary of State had taken this issue against a lot of opposition. And even his Cabinet colleagues wouldn't accept that the inquiry could cover other departments, but it should have done. It should have covered our aid programmes. It should have covered the Home Office. But it was a wonderful start, and Jeremy Hunt should take a lot of credit for having mm -hmm. set it on the road. And it's now created debate in the UK about how we respond to these figures and every single British diplomatic mission has been told take this as a top priority you know we care about some obscure things I often say that when a fox arrives at Westminster holding a placard saying save the human race we might see the illogicality of some of the issues we do care about <laughs> and the discrepancy between those that we really have a duty to care about so yeah I'm glad that we've got this report it's it's a benchmark Jeremy Hunt says uh, in the report that for too long governments have preferred vague language of general condemnation rather than face the problem of anti-Christian discrimination and persecution and the abuse towards Christians. And he says it should be correctly defined and labeled as Christophobia. How important is that and do you imagine governments will embrace that idea? Well, I think but officials are beginning to wake up to two things, that this isn't just about a gross violation of human rights, it's also about the kind of countries that you shape. So there's a direct correlation, for instance, between countries that are prosperous and that have economic growth and enjoy religious freedom, and the hobbled economies of countries like Pakistan or Eritrea or North Korea, where because they don't enjoy these rights, those are countries that continue to, to wallow in the depths of the worst, most acute forms of poverty. Mm -hmm. And then you look at migration. What is the driver that leads to so many people trying to escape many of these countries? I'm dealing with a case at the moment of two elderly women who have escaped from Aleppo. They're mm. currently now in the Lebanon. They want to come and live in the UK. They'd much rather live in Aleppo. But how can you live there when you're being subjected to genocide? That's the word that US Congress, it's the word that the British Parliament, the European Parliament use. Now, either it's genocide or not. Either it's the crime above all crimes or it's not. So governments need to take these things a lot more seriously than they have for economic reasons, as a driver for migration, but also because of the massive violation of human rights. After all, we enjoy enormous privileges, freedoms and liberties mm -hmm. in our free societies and democracies, but we need to remember our own story. It's written into the DNA of the American Constitution. It's written into the experiences of Catholics in countries like England. Persecution we know all about. Let's do something about it in our own times. Mm. You are the co-chair of the Pakistan Minorities All-Party Parliamentary Group, okay? And you recently wrote a piece in the House Parliament magazine yeah. where you state that in the past decade, 2.6 billion British pounds have poured into Pakistan. However, yeah. there's been a failure to dif differentiate how and where the money is spent. Uh, and, and that leads the Department for International Development to say it is no idea how much money actually reaches these destitute minorities. You have called on the British government to reassess the basis on which it spends this money. How can they ensure accountability here, that the, the monies actually reach those most in need of it? Well, for your viewers to get some understanding about the scale of the money that the UK gives to Pakistan, who are the biggest recipients of our aid program mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, it is over £2.6 billion pounds in the last decade. But put another way, that's over £380,000 each and every single day pouring in in many cases unaccountably into Pakistan and not reaching the minorities. During my visit to Pakistan last November, where I was taking up the case of Asiya Bibi, the right. illiterate Catholic woman who spent nine years on death row in Pakistan mm -hmm. and whose cell in Multan is now occupied by another illiterate Catholic woman called Shagusta Khalsa mm. and where many others are also in, 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 in incarceration. But I went out and visited the so-called colonies where uh, the Christian communities live around Islamabad and Lahore. In one of them there are more than 30,000 people. There's no running water, there's mm. no electricity, living in squalid conditions with earthen floors and none of our aid program are reaching these groups. Why? Because aid agencies and departments of state say they are religion blind. Well, they shouldn't be religion blind. I mean, one of our most uh, courageous 
correspondents for BBC, uh, Lise Doucet, says, if you don't understand religion, you don't understand the world. In other words, you have to get down there and understand what is happening to these minorities, because you'll never create a decent and good society if you don't protect such minorities. And the suffering communities in, in Pakistan, where girls are being forced into uh, arranged marriages where they're being abducted when they're only eight or nine years of age uh, over a thousand Hindu and, and Christian girls we've highlighted this in a new report that is about to be published but as a result of the debate I initiated in Parliament two weeks ago Raymond I'm glad to say that our International Affairs Select Committee in the House of Commons only a week ago agreed to launch a full-scale inquiry into how British aid money is being spent in Pakistan long long overdue but very welcome uh, I've got to ask you this before I let you go. Recently in the UK, a judge ordered a mentally ill woman, a Catholic woman, to have a forced abortion. That judge overruled the, the initial ruling. You wrote that the appellate decision, quote, restores my faith in our judicial system. Are you concerned, though, that this is not a one-off case yeah. and that we're going to see more of this? Well, Raymond, earlier in the year, with my courageous colleague, Baroness Olone, Nula Olone, mm -hmm. we introduced a bill in Parliament about the rights of conscience. And the reason we introduced the bill was because two Catholic midwives in Glasgow, in Scotland, were told that they would lose their jobs if they were not willing to organise and help to set up abortions. And they said, we're midwives, that's our vocation. We're not going to do that. They lost their jobs as a consequence. So the erosion of conscience it has been underway for some time. And this latest case was a graphic example of the encroachment of the state on the family. When the state prosecutes and says, you will have an abortion because we say that is the right thing to do against the wishes of the grandmother, against the wishes of the mother who has learning difficulties, against the advice of the social worker who said that the mother and grandmother were perfectly able to bring up this child. That really disturbs me, but I was glad that the Court of Appeal stopped the abortion from proceeding. It had already been set in motion to take place on the day that the court overruled that decision, mm. and three judges of appeal said no. But when you read the detailed, the detailed uh, findings of that Court of Appeal, you, you see some very disturbing things, one of which was that they w were going to arrange for a substitute to be given to the mother, a doll, a female doll, so that she wouldn't realise the baby mm. that she had lost. And they used the word baby, not unborn child or fetus. They knew oh, what they were doing. Yeah. So this is an extraordinary state of affairs. Lord David and I think Alton. we have to contest it all the time, Raymond. But it's... Yeah, I, I'm sorry to cut you short, Lord David Alton. I know your time is tight and so is ours. But I yeah, also want right. to point out Sam Brownback awarded you and Congressman Frank Wolf uh, as uh, an award for being the fathers of the freedom of religion and belief movement. And I entirely concur. Lord David Alton. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Rick.